מאוד. For the record, as you see it here, it's a Noah Hightower in command, a door tree number four. Number four. And today we will speak about how to, uh, how to play uh, with love and fear. Maybe that would be the title for today. So uh, still uh, under idolatry, commandment, chapter one. And we, as we move on, we, we talk about Elohim, God. And now today we're gonna to talk about one implication of what we are talking about is how to pray. Uh, so what's the, what's the story? Uh, as we remember last class, we talked about how Elohim created the world with wisdom. Uh, what kind of wisdom? Uh, a bina, detail. Bina is learning one deriving one from another. So it's a sort of a wisdom that men use, we use a lot. We learn something and then we derive things from another, one thing from another. But also if you think about it, evolution, the whole evolution is one creature coming out from another. So Elohim, the notion that Elohim created the universe with Bina, learning or, or deriving one, e one issue from another really fits the evolution. <laughs> the rabbi saw the hint for the wisdom, and we already mentioned it. It says at the head of the event, in Hebrew, in English, it's the beginning, but <clears throat> in Hebrew, it can, it can be read as at the, at the head of the event, Elohim created the heaven and earth. Hence he had a, a herd, a head, H-E-A-D. <clears throat> so the, the Kabbalah says, is a very important issue in Kabbalah in Chabad. He looked at the head, at the wisdom of the head, and created the universe. And with what kind of wisdom? We said not, not, not only chokhmah, general wisdom, but bina in detail, in a new detail. <clears throat> so uh, how, can we, we, how can we see that wisdom? Uh, we look at nature. Uh, we look at the story, the story of Genesis. Uh, it looked like uh, uh, the sixth floor building had a plan, it, uh, got, Elohim had a plan. He checked to see every day if it's good or not. And uh, each, each uh, floor, each, each uh, level, each stage served the next one on top of it. So there is a wisdom here. Uh, the creature, the vegetation on, on, on Tuesday, on the third day, helped creature later on to like cattle, of course, and also for the fish to develop from the vegetation in, in, the, in the water. So each stage uh, serves the next one to come. So there's a plan, wisdom. <clears throat> if you turn the microscope, you can see that, and you uh, search each day to see how wondrous it is. For instance, the crust, the crust that happened at the end of the day one, earth cooled off and formed a crust uh, of the, from so the lava actually stopped streaming. A crust, a solid crust was formed on earth's surface. That's the crust that we sit on it right now. And that crust uh, allowed water to accumulate on it. Now, first of all, to think about the miracle of Earth being at a, at a certain place on space 
where life can where life can be formed because life needs water they need temp certain temperature certain condition that can happen only on earth so far we haven't found any other planet <coughs> that really managed to develop life on it so far uh think about the water uh there is a although we search for water for many years we send satellites and and we said spaceships, but uh, they don't find water really, it, certainly not, not in the form of, of an ocean. And uh, the fact that the Earth developed such an ocean on this day two, uh, it's, it's a big miracle, it's a big wisdom, because it was necessary for life to develop. Had all the water been frozen, it would kill all, all uh, life on Earth, as it happened actually almost on day four. Earth was turned into ice ball, but it was still life retaining the water in the, in the, uh, in the water that didn't freeze. So health has to be a certain distance from the sun and in space in order to, to allow water to, to flow, and not just to freeze or to evaporate, if you want. So it's a miracle. Uh, and we go on and on and we get each stage of the creation is really a miracle. How each creature is born uh, to, to support another creature on top of it. Okay, they, 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 don't, they don't come out at random. They are designed to, 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 to to move the to to move the building up, and um, I can go on and on and talk about these miracles in the in the story of creation. Um, and uh, one of the great miracles is that each creature is born equipped with everything it needs to survive from birth. Uh, the fish knows exactly what kind of a of, of grass, of each, what kind of stuff it should eat and what stuff it should not eat. The birds dive into the water. Each, each bird actually got its own fish. There is a whole school of bird in the sky, but each bird got its special, special uh, uh, fish for, for itself and not for its friend. The very Fly, fly, the, the, the fact that the bird flies to so many distances <clears throat> without ever being learned, nobody teach them. They can be born on the way and they can join, join, join the, 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 the group. In fact, uh, if you, you can take, you can take uh, experiment that took, uh, uh, an egg from a bird that never actually flew and the, the chicken, the, the bird that came out of it, chicken didn't have any friend, didn't have anybody to tell him where to go. And yet when they release it, they, it joined the pack right away. He knew, he knew exactly how to, where to fly and what stop to make like the rest of them. And it's a miracle, it's a gene, it's not only genes, <clears throat> and uh, they try all kind of experiment to, to find out what caused the bird to, to what bring them to, to have such, such, such a knowledge, and we still don't know. So miracle of, uh, uh, miracle, by, by saying miracle, it means it's, it's extraordinary, it's natural, it's nature, but the fact that uh, those things are set up in, in such a way to provide each creature its need, it shows some wisdom in it. <clears throat> Think about the DNA, uh, the, the monocellular uh, cell that they actually settled on Earth. This is the first life form on Earth. It had to be, it, ha it has to, it had to, to have a granite island with a certain, sh certain sh shore, 
slope uh, that uh, had a shell of water on one hand and a bundle of sun. And so other form of, of, of rock wouldn't support it. So here come granite with a slopery slope uh, on, the, on, on the shore. And the granite allowed the, the, the monocellular to settle. And they are equipped with, the, with this, all, all equipped with DNA or RNA and everything necessary to produce protein and life sustaining material. And they release O2 and take the, the carbon to, to themselves. And here, here they produce oxygen. Obviously, uh, the creator uh, made them in such a way that they will move the creation forward, the creation of all Earth forward. So again, if I go step by step, I can analyze it. And I saw how many miracles are in, in, in the story. I think one of the greatest miracles of all uh, that really mind boggling and, and, and actually negated the story of evolu a random evolution is the story of a Cambrian, Cambrian period. Cambrian period, we said, fit day five, that suddenly, without any predecessor, uh, without any uh, background, there is explosion of life in, in the water just in a few hundred thousand of years, maybe close to a million a year, but not too, in geological term, not, not too long, not too long a period. There is explosion of life in the water with millions of species that all occurred in a very short time, developed. And to say that they came out, they all developed by random mutation and natural selection, it uh, doesn't explain it because if you uh, uh, if you just use random selection, random mutation and selection, uh, it requires so much time. That is, uh, I mean, million times more than than the Earth life. There is no no time to to the, to develop those creatures just by mutation. Some 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 knowledge, some some and builder put this information there at a certain time, suddenly there was an explosion of life. As you see the, the eye, the first eye, the first node, the first smell, the, the, the first mobile creature with the, the predator and, and so on. All this yet we describe it, we already describe it in this area. As Moses says, day five, there were fish, the life, uh, the water in the ocean swallowed with fish, and then bird and then the crocodile. So all this explosion of life on Earth and the swamps uh, negate actually uh, uh, the story of uh, the, the common sense, the co what, co what people commonly think that everything developed by random mutation. No, there is a hand of a builder here. And we can go on and on. Uh, there is a book here, I mentioned it before. It's called, the, uh, published recently by Stephen Meyer. Uh, Stephen My Meyer, it's called Return of the God Hypothesis. Wow. He goes, he doesn't speak about biology as much as he speaks about physics and how it's impossible to explain the universe without the hand of a builder, uh, intelligence, which we call God. Now, let's, let me put it one way, uh, a point here. The wisdom of God is certainly, the true wisdom of God is beyond us. We, our human mind cannot perceive it, but we can perceive it through the, through the spectacle of nature, because this we can understand. I can understand that kind of wisdom I described because it speaks to me, I can understand it. Our mind is built to comprehend it. 
the true wisdom of God, uh, but whatever he had on his mind, so to speak, is beyond us. So let's remember that point. So <clears throat> the question is now, having this knowledge in our hand, what can we do with it? Why it was written in fact, well, it was written uh, to, to, as you said, that uh, as Moses uh, believed, maybe he knew that one day uh, people will find out the truth and they will believe in, in the Bible because they find out that chapter one is true. But there is more than that because there are some implication of that knowledge. Uh, one of the implication of that knowledge that we have now about the wisdom of God in creation is prayer. Now, what, are, what do I mean prayer? How, how is it connected to prayer? <clears throat> the story is what the rabbi said, <clears throat> that prayers do not go up to heaven if they are not accompanied by emotions like love of God and fear of God. If you just sit there and say a text, it will, it will not go up. It is nothing. It has to be accompanied by at least two, two important emotions, ahava vira, as the love of God, and fear of God. <clears throat> uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, what kind of prayer I'm talking about? There are, there are, there are prayers that come out from the heart at the time of a need. If a person is standing before a surgery or some, some kind of situation, <clears throat> he is, is, is aching, he need help, and he pray to God for help. For that, there is no, for that kind of prayer, there is no structure. A person can pray like that anywhere, anytime, in any language. <clears throat> and in fact, sometimes he doesn't even have to say any word. Hashem can read his mind. Like what? Like Noah. Take Noah. When Noah prayed after the flood in a Mount Moriah, uh, he, he offered burn offering, silent burn offering without any prayer. As, as he pulled out his thought in a smoke that came out from, from the burning flesh. Hashem actually smelled the, the aroma of the, of the smoke and he listened to, to Noah without Noah ever saying anything. So that's a classical silent prayer out of distress. Noah was worried about the flood, uh, after the flood, that the flood may come back. Why should he start civilization again? <clears throat> His children soon start killing each other for this reason, for that reason, bloodshed will return and the flood will return. It's almost like a given fact. So why should he, he start civilization again? And his frustration, uh, he, he offered prayer to, to God in that uh, silent prayer. And God answered him. God read his thought without him saying a word. So that kind of prayer, uh, we understand, doesn't need any structure. You can say anything. You don't fix it. You just pull your heart and that's it. But we are talking about another sort of prayer. A prayer, like say, of a congregation. A congregation of Noahide meet, or Jews, in a synagogue or prayer hall, and they offer a service to God by chanting, by uh, there is a choir, uh, there is music, uh, there is a, somebody delivering a speech, and there is a text written, and they could use songs or poetry or whatever it's the, the congregation uh, finds suitable. So it's a kind of a service. You don't, you, don't, you don't do it out of distress, 
but there's a kind of a service to God, that kind of prayer we are talking here. So those kind of prayer, if they just said automatically, mechanically, just because it's nice, or the music is good, and you sit and chant the road without thinking about them, without any emotion of love and fear, uh, you see, it's beautiful, but it doesn't count to anything. The rabbi said it will not go up. For instance, I can give you a story to, to show you what I mean <coughs> about the founder of Hasidism, uh, Baal Shem Tov, the Besh. Uh, there is a story about him. He traveled along, along, uh, a lot in Ukraine and Poland. Uh, this is the 18th century, okay, middle of the 19th century. And uh, he came to a synagogue that is known for his beautiful building and wonderful choir and beautiful congregation. And I want to show him the, the synagogue. So he comes, he comes to the synagogue, the copyright, this small group of disciples. Hasidism was nascent. It was just the beginning of Hasidism. So he had a few uh, students with him and he, they approached the building. Uh, and uh, the Besh, the Baal Shem Tov, opened the door. He looked in and suddenly he retracted back and he closed the door. He doesn't enter. The disciple see him doing it. So he goes again to the door, he opens it, tries to get, enter. Well, he, he stuck, he retracted right away, closed the door several times, and he never comes in. Finally, he's turned around and goes away. <clears throat> so the disciple wonder, Rabbi, our teacher, why, wh what are you doing? Why didn't you go in to see the sinner inside? He said, you don't understand. As I opened the door, I see a tons and tons of prayer floating in the air there. And I just couldn't enter it. It's just full of, full of prayer. So the disciple said, so what's wrong with that? You know, the prayer. He said, no, you don't understand. The prayer shouldn't be here. We shouldn't go up. What are they doing here in the synagogue? <laughs> so that story, so what he meant, of course, that they came out, those prayers were wonderful, wonderful choir and beautiful clothes and beautiful people. But uh, the air was full of this air, uh, prayer. They didn't go up, they didn't ascend. They lack the emotion of fear and, and uh, love of Hashem. <clears throat> so, for instance, another example I can show you. Last week, Parsha, when I, Jacob dream, uh, the letter that he, had, he saw in the dream, the angel of God ascending and descending. So one of the interpretation is that the angel actually carried the prayer up to heaven and they, when they descend, they take with them the response to Hashem to the prayer. So the, the angel should go up and down and they carry the, the prayer. And if you are not accompanied by the proper fear, and oh, and love, and they don't go up as you just Jacob himself wake up and says, How awesome is this place? Manora. Manora actually means he feels. Uh, it's not only awesome, it's a, it's a fearful. It, it, didn't, it, it was not fear of, of punishment. It's a fear of awesome, awesome fear of respect to, as if before you stand, uh, when you stand before it. A, uh, a king, uh, royalty, uh, fear of, of all rather than punishment. So, so that's, and also love for Hashem. So the, without those emotions, uh, the prayer won't go up. Okay, the question is, if so, if you require a prayer to, to go up with a, a midot, midot in emotional, midot attribute, 
אלא כאהבה ויראה, עולה וגול. How can you, do, how can you expect a normal person who, who has spent all his day uh, with mundane things, right? struggling for his livelihood, uh, issue of health, of family, you know, our day is full of tribulation and problems, sometimes happiness, but mundane, you are totally involved in it. Suddenly to come to the synagogue, the prayer board, and you expect, expect him to switch mode and suddenly sit there full of love and fear of Hashem, it's impossible. How can, how can you even expect such a thing? <clears throat> so here, here the Rambam come and help us to understand how. The Rambam put a way how a person should really uh, feel, his, feel his heart with the love and emotion. The Rambam point is <clears throat> use your mind. The mind dictate what your emotions are. So if you fill the mind with information, the proper information, uh, then the mind will push a, right, a steer in you the right emotion. The, more, the mind can steer in you many emotions, positive and negative. It depends what, what's inside the mind, what you're thinking about. But you need to fill the mind with information, intelligent information, that will steer your heart, arouse in it the proper midot emotion. So remember, the, the top, the, the, <clears throat> this illustration of man, man nature or soul, uh, the, the mind is supreme and emotion come out from the mind. Okay, that's the essence of Hasidut. Chabad, Chabad is the mind. Chabad, Chochma, Bin Adad, control, uh, stir up in you the proper emotion. So you need, in order to, to switch, to rise in, you, in the prayer, in the person who pray, in order to steer with him the right uh, love and fear of Hashem, he needs to think about something. What is about, what he should think about? <clears throat> so the Rambam goes on and on. Here is I quote you from the Rambam, you'll quote uh, the, the law of uh, foundation of the Torah, uh, second second chapter, second chapter, and I I translate it to you. <clears throat> the Rambam says. There are three primary commandments. One of them, the first one is to know Hashem, to know his name, and, and be, a, uh, be acquainted, uh, familiar with the titles, because it says in the first command, in the tablet, he says, I am, remember, I am the, the Lord your God. I am Hashem your, your Elohim, who took you out of Egypt. That's a command, that's an introduction, but it's also a commandment to know Hashem with his name and to be familiar with, with the Lord's name, to understand the meaning. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that you love Hashem. That's a, that's a commandment by itself. The second commandment, Ram, the Ramam says, is indeed to love Hashem. Because it says you should love Hashem, your, with all your heart, and so on, and so on, uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, the third commandment is to fear Hashem. He said, you shall fear Hashem, your God, and look him, and so on. So those three commandments, to know, to love, and fear, are, are primary. The, call it the Rambam, he put them on the top of, the, of his book. Now he goes on and say, okay, what is, I show you, what is a way to love and fear God or Hashem? He says, I'm going to show you how. And I, I quote to you, <clears> to <throat> said, whenever a person examines Hashem's deed or action in his, in, his, in his word, 
the in, in, in the world and examine his wondrous creature and realize from them Hashem wisdom that is so unlimited. Remember, see what, what I'm saying. You examine and from and from the examination of the creature and nature, you learn from those from, from this examination, you come to understand Hashem wisdom that is so unlimited and so awesome. And once you get once you get there, that's in your mind, immediately you would find you, you love Hashem and praise him for, for that wisdom. Uh, that any uh, any you will aspire to to know his name and to love him, <clears throat> and then he says, whenever a person takes those things to his heart, and he understands the wisdom of God in nature and so on, he would immediately retract back with fear and awe, recognizes how small, and insignificant creature he himself. So the Rambam, remember, it doesn't even mention the Torah here. I would expect the Rambam to say, okay, you learn Torah and you love Hashem. No, he doesn't say that. He says, look at nature, its creatures, and you see the wisdom from them, the wisdom of God from them, from nature. And then you come to, it will instill in you necessary, the, the, this, this intellectual engagement will instill in you, once you get it in your heart, in your mind, you will surely come to love him and to appreciate and to fear at the same time also fear. So love is coming forward and fear is kind of attracting back a little. <clears throat> and let's so, and then he goes on to tell you, I'll show you, and he show you some example from nature that he thinks are, are awesome. Well, we know much better that aspect. You see, uh, 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 the, 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 the prayer book, the Siddur, is actually uh, built, uh, our Siddur is really following the Rambam uh, advice. We start every day, we start with psalms. And the psalms that we say at the beginning of the prayer, uh, all of them are selected for the prayer book because they describe God's power and wisdom in nature. How many stars there are, and how many creatures you created, and the uh, cedar of Lebanon, and so on. <clears throat> the sea, and you provide them the, everything they need. Everything we said is there on those psalms. So the idea is that once you run through the psalms, then you get to the Shema, which is a commandment, the love Hashem, and you read love Hashem, you come to love Hashem through that path. And then you, the door of the temple are open and they offer the, 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 the daily uh, offering, which is actually designed to instill fear in you. Fear in you mean, <clears throat> don't just come to Hashem with love. I want to cling to you. Uh, I love you. Well, there is a fear. If you retract back, it's still, uh, God is, is a burning fire. You don't cling to him uh, just without any fear. You have to retract back. <clears throat> so the Siddur, and then the Amida prayer. So the Siddur and Amida prayer is, written there because once you have love Hashem and fear of Hashem, then you can say the Amida and, uh, and, and you expect the Amida of the prayer, what you say will are sent to God. If provided you're not just saying that, but you really think about what, you, what you're saying. Now, the problem is, as you can imagine, this is how the Siddur is built. And the wisdom there is a wisdom that in Psalms so, so The problem that many rabbis notice today that uh, as, as beautiful as the Psalm songs are, 
uh, they don't speak to us anymore like that. No, we are not so impressed by the cedar of Lebanon. We are not so impressed by the fact that there are stars. We know more than that. We know about the cosmos. Uh, we know so much about the cosmos, black holes and galaxies. So for, for us, just to say that the sky is full of stars, that's, a, that's only initial step. But we, modern men, modern people, need a little more insight. So there's a trend now in Israel <coughs> for many rabbis. One of them is like Ben Porat in Jerusalem, beautiful lectures he gave, unbelievable lectures. That he spent hours with the students telling them not only about uh, the, the law of David Shulchan Aruch and of, of uh, Talmud, but tell him, I tell him uh, how wondrous the universe is. How he, he, take, he, he follow that advice and he tell him about the wisdom of nature. To instill in them uh, the love and fear for Hashem. It's not only the Rambam, there are many other poskim after the Rambam. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, The Dew of the Heart by Rabbi Nobachi, who is Spain, uh, hundreds of years later, actually developed the whole idea to much higher level. He actually goes on page after page to describe uh, how a person should it body note, you should, you should really spend time in, uh, observing nature and from that deriving the uh, fear of uh, love Hashem, uh, of wisdom, he recognizes action in, in, in nature. Now, how much more so we, that now we have the, we understand that the chapter one is a miraculous way, miraculous chapter. <clears throat> when I read it, I stand in awe. I, I immediately recognize how miraculous the chapter is. It really still in me, in me personally, <clears throat> it's still a lot of fear and love, love for Hashem, love, understand the, 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 the impossibility that uh, uh, Moses concocted it from his own mind three, three hundred, about thousand of years ago. It is a miracle in his hand. And so, uh, and then uh, when, I, when I think about <clears throat> the universe as we know it, I speak about the quantum physics. I think about uh, uh, there we are only, only now opening our door to, to understand the nature even more and more. We, we, we understand we have the computers and we have now the the power to, to understand nature a million times than our predecessor, our ancestors did. So we can, instead of being shying away from that science and say, oh, the science negated Torah, on the contrary, science and the finding help us to come to love Hashem and to realize how awesome his wisdom there is. And, uh, and uh, and then to come through that into, into, uh, into love and fear of shame. One more point, I want to mention it. Uh, what, what I, everything I said until now is, is developed, is a, is a foundation of Hasidut, 17th century. They developed this approach, 18th century, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, they developed this enormous approach. I mean, they understood the first time that uh, really you have to develop fear and love of Hashem. So they spent. They developed now a new, a new way to pray. That's why Hasidim can spend time, hour before the prayer, in order to, it boninu, they call it, observation, to incite if you, in you, uh, the, 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 uh, the love of, and fear of Hashem. If you just go from the synagogue, from out from the street, 
to the synagogue and just start to pray, it's, you did nothing. So, so they, they teach the students and uh, the congregation is to really uh, develop uh, th uh, this um, habit to, to, before you start even prayer, you spend time with body note, you should uh, observe. Now, what do you gain by that? That's the question. Well, suppose I don't do it. Suppose I just uh, uh, pay my due and I pray and go home. <clears throat> what, what the Hasidus, Hasidus said, why should a person really follow that line? It's, the, the point here is not just a prayer. After all, we don't pray here for our own uh, needs. That's a different prayer. It's a service of the a service of the community, and you sit there among other fellow people, fellow prayer, uh, and and um, and you uh, come, you, you approach God, and you talk to Him with a knee. I I'm you and me. Uh, that's the only only time you really talk to God person to person, so to speak. Now here come, here's the main point. The Hasidic teach that if you, if you fall, if you offer that prayer uh, from full of heart and in fear, you gain not just that uh, the prayer will ascend up, but uh, you gain a approach closeness to the Shekhinah. Remember, we will talk about later in our class how the Shekhinah needs to dwell in our heart, aspire to enter your heart. When you approach her with such a, a prayer, she will enter your heart and fill it with joy and, uh, and uh, dedication and holiness. And she will push you to do the things that she loves beyond just charity. You really uh, mercy and compassion and so on. But that's only the, the result of that. But, yeah, but uh, uh, we're not just looking for what you're gonna do when, when Shrina come to your heart, uh, what action you take. Of course, you will take all the necessary steps, uh, do things that she loves, we talk about it. But, the fact that she she enter your heart, and the only way it's the only way to teach that people can come come close to Hashem. Even learning Torah will not bring you to such a level of of the Shekhinah coming to us. So in their teaching, Hasidic teaching, the prayer, if it's offered, if it's done in this way. Uh, you, 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 it's the, the epitome of faith. That's the climax of, of what you can get on earth uh, in terms of come, come close to Hashem. So that's a precious moment uh, of the day that you, you can achieve something that otherwise you will never achieve. And there are many, many people who go through life and they never, never feel it, they never experience it. So you, that's a, a technique, a special technique you follow the Rambam uh, to love and love Hashem. So in summary, what I want, what I want to say today, I made a pause uh, in, our, in our classes. So instead of, of course, we are going to learn about the dollars, we continue our saga, we teach about the idols, and we teach about the Shekhinah later on. <laughs> but at that point, when we, we spoke already about the Lokim, and the Lokim is a builder of nature. And we spoke about the sixth floor and his wisdom. And, uh, and I thought to myself, well, really, that's the point, that's the time to, to see the implication of that. And the implication of that is, uh, surprise, surprise, 
but it's uh, it's enormous application to the way we approach God and we pray to him and and we, we even hope we can get the uh, Shekhinah close to him and he will come close to us. I'll stop here maybe, have, an, uh, have any question? I was just uh, thinking, Rabbi, that in your comments about about nature and finding God in nature, and I'm wondering if, and, and you said something about we don't relate so much to the Psalms because we're not impressed by the cedars of Lebanon and things like that, like David's time was. And I'm wondering if it's because we've become an industrialized society yeah. and we don't go out in nature. I'm, I'm thinking about Nancy who's in our class today. She raises cattle and she's out there and seeing the life cycles and she's out there taking care of those cattle and seeing when one's born and when one dies. And she's seeing, she's seeing that. We, I live in the city. I, I'm disassociated from that. So I'm wondering if that has caused our disconnect with nature. Uh, when I, when I, you, I agree with everything you said, but I want to point out the wisdom of God is not just nature in terms of wealth and simple life cycle there and the creature itself. It's the wisdom. Uh, when I realize about the DNA in each creature, about the cell divide, uh, and uh, how they grow, how they die, how our body is built. Now, in order to understand that, you need sophistication. You need to be industrial, if you want. Uh, and in a person who is in industry, who is involved, who is a, all his day uh, uses chips and computers, is no less uh, prone to understand God the wisdom of God in that sense is not the same as a person who spend time outdoors with, with the animals, but, but in terms actually on the level of, of wisdom of God that actually put a computer in our DNA. Our DNA is a computer. And uh, so, and, uh, so and the, uh, you think about the cosmos, you speak about a higher level, a different a level of nature. Uh, our life, whatever you, whatever we do, industry or outside door, agriculture, everything we do has implication to God wisdom. And uh, Rabbi Ben Porat, uh, he, uh, he, he gave, uh, he spent the uh, an hour talking about how miraculous it is that whatever we need as we, as we progress in, in civilization, our needs increase. Suddenly we find a solution in nature that pop up at a certain time, at the right time. Like uh, you give an example, uh, about a uh, hundred years ago, there was a Milton, uh, an English uh, uh, scientist who said, no, uh, mankind is going to die because we multiply much more than we can produce food. Very soon, there will be more people that uh, we can provide food. And man, mankind will start, start dying like flies. So we need to find a For years, it, was, it looked like a real problem. Because man, mankind proliferate much more, it looks like, than we produce. That no, or in a minute, we won't be able to feed them. Today, we are 8 million, billion people on earth. Thank goodness. Turn out, as Rabbi Porat said, turn out that our science unexpectedly grew up in such a way that we can produce now hundred percent, if not thousand percent, more food than before. 
<clears throat> like uh, uh, tomatoes. Uh, in the past, they used uh, 200, mil 200 kilograms from, from a dunam, from a southern area. 200, uh, let's say 200 pounds. Today, you can produce from the same, same side of a lot about 10 or 100 times more tomatoes than in Iraq because they found a formula to, that the tomato needs to proliferate. So suddenly we can produce a lot of tomatoes. We could produce a lot of corns that, and, and so on and so on. So science suddenly finds solution at the right time. And if you look at Rabbi Ben Porat said, if you look at the event, what brought the, the, the discovery of, the, of, the, of this chemical that promoted tomato or the chemical that promoted the, the corn or, or any other such a need, all this invention came out almost like a unexpected. They pop up suddenly in a scientist's mind. Sometimes without even, uh, the scientist himself doesn't know, doesn't believe it happened to him. As if it's like a, a, in, a, a, as if God, uh, so to speak, the builder of the universe took, took care of that. The moment we need more, we can find solution more. Uh, uh, everything in, in nature, uh, we can use it for our need, he said. Uh, take the, the spider, the spider web. You know, the spider web is 10 times, a million times stronger than, than, uh, than uh, uh, steel. Thinner and much stronger, well, much more stronger than the steel. So what they came out, come out, and lighter, much lighter. So now they use a spider web to for satellite to buy to to tie down all kind of thing in a satellite. So even a spider has a huge uh, that we found at a certain time when we need it. So as if there is a built-in mechanism here that God provide us, provide us that we can find. We have the wisdom to find out what we need at a certain time, at a certain <clears throat> place when, when we need it. So that's what he said, he's the is ultimate provider. And we can recognize, we should recognize it. And of course, don't do it for our detriment. Don't use it for wrong purposes. But we should give thanks to Hashem and, and to thank him for for this wisdom that we put in us and in nature, that we can match, they can match our need. So each creature is born, is born with everything it needs to survive. And the wisdom of, it, of that statement is very deep. So whatever you do, industry or agriculture, you can find a, a hint for that wisdom of God that provide us the very fact that we have industry. The industry help us to survive and to change and to grow much more than the agriculture. It's by itself is a miracle. And when we think about it, before we sit in prayer and we, and we say thanks to Hashem for that wisdom and thank you, uh, uh, for, for giving me, making it for me, I am alive because of you. Thank you now with the love of Hashem and fear of Hashem. The fear is needed because you should not come too close to Hashem. I, I love you, I hug you, no. You, you, you tremble with fear. At the same time you love it. That combination is unique to Judaism. Love with fear. Any other, uh, we can talk more about it, but is there any, any other questions? Do you think the more we understand something like unlocking secrets of the cosmos or 
how the body works, any, any area we want to think of where our knowledge of how something works has increased. Yes. Does that increase our awe of it or does it decrease our awe of it? When we understand it, do we lose our awe of it? If you think, first of all, when you discover things in nature, you should remember this, this thing that you discover is part of wisdom of, of God. That's step one. But then you then you, you take another step and you say, thank you, God, for giving me the mind and the ability to understand it and the ability to use what I'm do, what I'm standing now to my purpose. Maybe the science is, is progressing. Uh, by 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 applying all this finding, all this beautiful thing that we find in nature, applying it to our life, to enrich our life, to enrich our medicine, to expand our universe, uh, the look on the, on the universe. We are we live richer and brighter, and much smarter than our predecessor in terms of our knowledge. So all that is due to science, which is a blessing from God. He, he, he made, he created the world with science and he put it in our mind. And we thank him for, for that and we love him for that. And we fear him for that. And if I pray with this feeling, if I use this feeling when I, I, I stir in me those feelings, while sitting in the synagogue and spending some time before I pray. At the same time you say the psalm song, <clears throat> you can add, I, that's what I do. The same, I read the psalm song, but in my mind, I go on and I say, it's not just the city of Lebanon. It's the, it's the black holes. It's the nova that is floating around that baked our organic material, our, our, the organic material that compose our body, they're all backed by, by exploding nova. All the molecules that we have in our body, they, they, who, how they were made by, by exploding stars somewhere. So when I realized that, it's, it's, uh, I, I still know much more than just seed of Lebanon, so to speak, because I know more. Thank you, Rabbi. All right. So thank you, Sandy, and uh, thank everybody who listened. And um, uh, God willing, we'll meet uh, next week, Monday, and continue our uh, story with idolatry. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah.